Welcome to Professor Russell Esposito's channel on information security. This video is just one of many video modules that are part of Professor Esposito's course on the subject. Video modules for his entire information security course are located on this channel. So remember to hit the like button as well as subscribe if you enjoy the video. Thank you for watching. I won't read this entire list to you, but as you can see, there's quite a number of different technologies that we'll be looking at in this uh, module. Some of you may be aware of what a firewall is, I would imagine. Um, the basic concept here is to protect the trusted proprietary information on the left-hand side of the firewall from the wild, wild west, the internet, um, from uh, dangerous attacks, from viruses, from, um, from various malware, uh, stop malicious attachments. So it's essentially a way just to protect and only allow through the firewall the genuine valid users who have legitimate access to the data on the inside. We'll, we'll go a little bit further in the next few slides how we can make this a little bit more sophisticated. Just to provide a little levity here, I thought I'd put this little Dilbert cartoon in here. And what happens is that uh, firewall misconfigurations can often cause problems, uh, stop various approved applications from entering the passing through the firewall, create bottlenecks in performance. So, you know, the little cartoon here is Dilbert's very reluctant and resistant to the concept of having uh, him uh, install the next firewall because usually what happens is whenever there's a problem uh, in, in most companies, the first place they look is the network or the firewall changes. Has anyone changed the firewall? So uh, just a little levity for the group. So let's talk a little bit about firewalls. Um, we'll go into firewalls in more depth in a later uh, module, but just since we're talking about network security, we should just touch upon it. Uh, so there's hardware-based firewalls that are usually uh, net, are usually located on a network. And then there's software-based on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, like Windows Defender, Windows uh, Firewall, that uh, that's, resides on a work host or workstation or server. Uh, so there's two sort of broad categories. If you look at the bottom of the, this slide here, we talk about some of the core functions, right? Pretty much all of the firewalls today are stateful. They can inspect the packet. They can even do a deep packet inspection right into the data packet to see what's in it. They can allow or deny traffic based on an IP address or a port. Um, there are stateless firewalls that sort of um, not really used much anymore that don't consider the state of the connection, but that's pretty much obsolete at this point. So most of them are stateful. They can examine what's happening with the live traffic, what's in the packet, what's in the header, what kind of addressing is being used, the IP address or the port. And they can also include sometimes malware and spyware, not so much on the uh, software-based firewalls, but on the hardware-based firewalls. Uh, and then they can do some uh, internal data protection of theft and loss of integrity. DLP, what's called DLP, data loss prevention, can examine uh, if there are large amounts of data moving around in the network at unusual times, or certain servers or databases that are being accessed and large uh, amounts of data, or just unusual activity with data. Uh, so these DLP features uh, also exist in firewalls. And we'll look at sort of some of the sort of next generation firewalls on the, uh, the next screen, which really pulls together a lot of functionality uh, in these, uh, what they call UTMs or next generation firewalls uh, on the next screen. So when we looked at all the functions in, in the previous screen, if all of those functions are present in the firewall, the uh, malware detection, the virus detection, the intrusion detection system, the intrusion prevention system, if that's all bundled into a firewall, it's generally called a next generation firewall, NGFW, or sometimes called UTM, Unified Threat Manager. Depending on the vendor, UTM is probably becoming a little bit more popular now, but you'll hear both these terms. And this is where the firewall can do all the things we talked about in the previous screen, stateful inspections, deep packet inspections, looking into the packet itself, you know, what's in the payload, and then do the IDS, IPS options, depending on how you configure it, it could stop certain activities or prevent them and then alert you alert you uh, to the prevention that preventive actions that it's taken. 
It can do data loss prevention, antivirus, anti-malware. And then in addition, it has what's called, and we're going to learn more about this in another module, a, a SIEM or a SIEM, S-I-E-M, Security Incident and Event Management System. And essentially what this does, it's a reporting system because there's a lot of data coming out of firewalls. There are lots of data coming out of routers and switches, and even machines have logs, event logs and security logs. So the, seam, the, the purpose of the SIEM is to correlate all that data, pull it together, and make it more easily, easily understood and, and displayed in a nice dashboard, dashboard of information that you could drill down into and, uh, and do some analysis. And the other thing it does is, you know, you have to realize that if you have firewalls and routers in different parts of the country, in different time zones, you may have an activity that's happening at the same moment or an activity that happened, you know, in the middle of the night at the same moment, but at different times. So what the seam does is it'll correlate those times to show you a unified time because something that's happening maybe noon time on the East Coast around 12 o'clock lunchtime might might not be hap might be happening in the morning in California. And it looked like these things happened in different times if you just looked at looked at the log separately. So the scene pulls it together, identifies that these events happened concurrently, irrespective of the, the fact that they had different time zones, and helps you interpret that data, you know, more logically. And then finally, I listed at the bottom of the screen, you know, the, the most common, most sophisticated firewalls. Palo Alto Networks seems to be getting for the last several years, you know, the most, you know, the highest ranks from uh, uh, research companies like Gartner and Forrester who look, do look at all these technologies and rank them and rate them. Cisco obviously also is up there as well as some others, just to give you a, an idea of what some of the vendors are that provide, you know, these kinds of firewalls for the industry. Okay, let's talk about this term, Network Access Control or NAC. And there are sort of three components to this. It, it's really essentially, if you think about it, how do you control access to the network? That's really what the NAC does, the Network Access Control. And one of the things is really the first bullet here is a health check. So, you know, companies buy laptops and uh, tablets, et cetera, and, and, and uh, desktops and various devices to connect to the internet, connect to the network, I'm sorry. And there has to be a health check. You know, they, they come from the factory, but they have to have the right antivirus put onto them, the right encryption, the latest security patches for the applications and the operating system, there may be some other security monitoring agents that need to be put on that machine as well. So it's sort of the health check. Is this machine ready, fully prepared to be connected to our, connected securely to our network that has all the right software to protect it and the right encryption? And the other kind of uh, sort of technique under NAC, under network access control, is filtering. Firewalls and routers filter IP addresses or MAC addresses. We talked about MAC addresses earlier, how every device has a MAC address, like a social security number for every hardware, you know, every piece of hardware, whether it's a phone or a laptop or a desktop or a tablet. Um, and you can control, you can filter and create these filters that are called ACLs, access control lists. That's the second bullet in the screen to allow or deny certain devices into certain parts of the network or subnets. So ACLs are common, they can be in firewalls or routers, but it's another way to filter traffic. So the first bullet health check ensures that the devices, the physical devices, have the right software, the right malware protection, and the right encryption. The second bullet is about filtering traffic. And the last bullet is obviously something we talked about earlier on, is Active Directory, you know, logical control access. You have to have an ID and a password to get the right privileges and rights to access parts of the system that you're entitled to. So that whole part of authentication, authorization. So these are the three main ingredients um, of what's called network access control or NAC. Okay, this slide talks about different IP addresses. So there are private IP addresses that reside internally in, on net, in networks, and there are public IP addresses. So what you probably haven't realized is that the private IP addresses that are inside, inside the firewall, inside the private part of the network, never gets communicated outside the network through the internet. It gets converted to a sort of a proxy uh, and, and a, 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 a nickname, right? Let's call it a public IP address, the bottom half of the screen. So they're separate ranges. Private IP addresses have the ranges the top part of the screen. Public IP addresses have the ranges the bottom part of the screen. I don't want you to have to worry about what these ranges are and the numbers. Just understand conceptually that there are private and public IP addresses. And there's a certain function called a NAT, 
at the top of the screen, Network Access Translator. And that's the, the function or the protocol that maps these two together, that takes a private IP, associates it with a public IT, IP, and sends it out to the internet. So your private address stays private. And then conversely, if you're trying to get uh, sports scores from some website, those private IP addresses in those internal systems never get communicated back. They similarly have, similarly have that NAT network address translation protocol running to, to assign a public IP address to communicate back to you. And we'll look at the next slide, which will show you sort of a little picture of how this NAT works. So this is a little sort of graphic that explains how NAT works, network access translation, network address translation. So you see on the left-hand side, Acme internal network. So some company, someone in the company wants to get a baseball or a football score. Their Acme internal IP address in the top center of the screen doesn't go outside the firewall. The firewall performs its NAT function and assigns a public address that goes out to, in this case, on the right-hand side of the screen, ESPN. Similarly, this website provides the sports news. Its internal IP address is then hidden from you. It goes through its firewall at the bottom of the screen. The, the NAT function is performed, and an external IP address is what you see back over on the left-hand side at the Acme company. So that's how, that's, how the NAT, that's how the NAT works. And again, you don't need to know the ranges of numbers, just understand the, the concept that there are internal IP addresses and external IP addresses. Okay, let's get a little bit deeper into network security. So there are security zones. And these zones are on the right-hand side, as you see the untrusted zone at the top is the, the wild, wild west, the internet, right? So there's a firewall right beneath that and there's something called the DMZ. And we're going to go through this in a little more detail, demilitarized zone. And that's where the, the external world can communicate with a company in the DMZ. That's where your web servers are, your e-commerce, you know, your, your you know, like Amazon or Walmart's, you know, computers that you interact with, they're in this DMZ. You don't, never really get past that second firewall, that middle one on the right-hand side, because beneath that second firewall in the middle is the trusted zone. And that's the corporate business logic and the business applications and data. So the DMZ prevents you from getting, it allows you to come in and do, get to email, get to e-commerce, do banking transactions, commercial you know, shopping, but you can't get past that second firewall to look at the trusted zone, the internal company's information, the HR, the human, re, re, human resources information, the profit, the financials of the company, the customer list, all in that trusted zone. Then there could be another zone, that final firewall at the bottom, into the restricted zone, which is for, say, um, you know, maybe executives or certain personnel. If they're doing mergers and acquisitions with other companies, there may be some very private information about what's being planned because you can't divulge that information. There might be insider trading on, with stock, and that's illegal. So there could be a few layers of the zone of, of this, how, of this, how, how this works. And, and we'll, uh, let's go to another slide and, um, and talk a little bit more about the DMZ and, uh, and how that works. So the DMZ is really a buffer zone between the internet and the company, all the internal systems, data, logic, and com com processing inside the system. Um, now that DMZ can be accessed by the outside world. And as the second bullet, just so we remember now, the inside world, the company, the IT people, people have to manage the web servers you know, the email systems, you know, they have to have access to that web server. So from both the DMZ is being accessed from both worlds, from the wild, wild west of the Internet, as well as the employees and the IT inside the company that need access to that for email or to do maintenance on systems in the DMZ. Any unnecessary services and software, the very last sentence here is important. It's something that is a universal, universal concept in many devices. Always shut off services, software that's not used, disable them, because they're just other avenues of attack, potentially. There could be a vulnerability. It's just another attack vector. It's another way that somebody could get in. So why leave a service or a port or you know some you know remote access open if you don't need to because it can create you know a vulnerability? So here's a, another picture of the demilitarized zone, right? The wild, wild west, the internet. The untrusted zone is on the left-hand side. There's the outer firewall, 
that protects the DMZ, that square box in the middle. And then the inner firewall that then protects the trusted zone from the wild, wild west, from the internet. You know, the corporate information, the financials of the company, the human resource personnel information, sales information, customer information, all protected behind that. And as we saw in that earlier slide that had the orange boxes, you could have another zone to the right of the trusted zone, you know, a restricted trusted zone that has fewer employees in the company uh, having access to that zone and another set of firewalls to the right as we saw that orange box up ahead. But that's sort of just, you know, you know, finessing the concept here. That's just, uh, you know, so you're aware. And the DMZ has three network cards. Again, this is something just I'm providing this just as a as other information, not something I'm going to test you guys on. But, you know, there's a, a network card to the Internet, a network card to the back internal network and a network card to the other devices in the DMZ. So the other devices connect to this uh, server with the network card and can communicate. So that's another way of looking at the demilitarized zone. Very, very common concept in network security. So two slides earlier, we talked about disabling functions, ports and services you're not using. That's called hardening. So you want to harden the operating systems. You want to harden any device you, you want to shut that's on the network. Shut down ports, services, remote access, various applications that could create a problem. If you're not using it, remove it or disable it. So that, of course, hardening is very hardening is very important to do the to the machines in the DMZ zone because they are more vulnerable being exposed to the outside world, right? But hardening is a concept we'll spend more time on in another module. But that concept essentially is locking down equipment, locking down routers and machines and firewalls to eliminate services, ports, functionality that you don't use because it may create a vulnerability. Another important concept. So let's change gears now and talk about VPNs, virtual private networks. So some of you may be aware of these. I mean, you could put a VPN on your phone. Some cost a few dollars a month, some are free. Um, and essentially what it does is give you another layer of protection, essentially. So you see the two red bars going through the cloud here. The internet is the, uh, again, the dangerous area, it's untrusted. So if you wanna tra you know, traffic your data through there, best do it through a VPN, a virtual private network. It's a, sort of an encrypted tunnel. The data is all encrypted. It's a virtual private network through the infrastructure of the network. You know, so this is typical if you're at home, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see the word you. You're connecting to work or, or to, uh, you know, well, not school here, but maybe if you're, if you're in IT, you might be accessing some, uh, some functions through a VPN. But typically, it's really uh, mostly employees working from home on their computer systems. And it provides another sort of layer, another function that protects the, everything that you're doing because you're running through the Internet in this secured private tunnel. And we'll, look, we'll take a little deeper look uh, in a few slides coming up. So this slide explains a little bit more about how a VPN works. So on the left hand side, it's the user with the computer at home. They have the VPN software package on their machine that was either pushed to them or given to them, you know, in a thumb drive. In some way, they, they load the software on their machine and it does the encryption, right? Goes through the Internet, goes over to the right hand side. And before it hits the corporate server, of course, there's going to be, you know, you're going to go through firewalls that aren't shown here and through the DMZ, potentially, if you're going to the trusted network in the back of the file in the back of the DMZ. But you go to a VPN endpoint device, sometimes called a VPN concentrator, and that'll do the de-encryption and allow you to communicate with the endpoints, the private trusted network behind the firewalls. Um, and the, the security protocol that is used is called IPsec. So you'll see it here in the second sentence of the first paragraph. VPNs use a variety of encryption protocols, mostly IPsec. That's the most common one. It's the most common security protocol. It's really a suite of protocols. IPsec is a protocol, and within that are a number of protocols doing a number of different security things. Um, so it manages this whole suite. We're going to learn more about IPsec later on. Um, but, and, but there's also another protocol called SSH called Secure Shell, Secure Shell at the bottom of the screen here. Less common, but it could be used in a, in a VPN, a virtual private network. But more often than not, the IPsec protocol is the one that's out there probably 95% of the time. And you'll see the power of IPsec when we, when we look into it a little bit more deeply in other, in other uh, uh, 
uh, module. Another um, technique that's used is virtual local area networks. And virtual local area networks are, this, are, are created for a lot of different reasons. But one uh, byproduct of it is, is that you get additional security. So you're segregating traffic, you're limiting resources, you're separating the way people can access systems. Uh, but VLANs are created for other reasons uh, because it makes it easier for, like for example, in this slide, as you can see, this is a, obviously a college, there's faculty, there's students, there's guests, different colors on the left and right. They can be in physically different places, but yet connect to the same virtual local area network, even though they're not you know, connected to, with wires to the same routers or the same switches. As you can see in this picture, there's a switches on the left, there's an S2. If you look at S1, S2, S3 in the center, S2 has some faculty to the left and S3 has some faculty to the right, but they're still on the green VLAN 10. So it's re they're really created for, um, for uh, reasons of uh, uh, making it more practical to access uh, uh, the same network from different locations, but a byproduct is it is additional security, and that it does help segregate traffic and se separate uh, the way people access different resources. So the previous slide sort of showed a macro view of VLANs. This slide shows sort of the micro view. So this is what it looks like in the back of the switches, right? We saw different faculty and different students on different switches, but yet accessing the same network and accessing the same resources on those subnets or those the virtual local area networks. And the back of the switches sort of look like this. So if green, if we stay with that analogy, green is faculty, you can see this faculty on switch A and faculty on switch B, their wires or their wireless connections are going to different switches and different buildings with different locations, but yet they're accessing the same resources. So you, as you can see here, this is what the back of the switches would be and how they would be cabled into them or a wireless connection to a, a, a Wi-Fi signal to a WAP device, a wireless access point in the ceiling that you usually see with the little antennas and little, sometimes lights, and they're wired into the back of, of the switch as well. And just a note on the bottom, this was uh, something we talked about briefly when we went through network fundamentals, but I think you really should be aware and know that these two protocols, 802.3 is for wired ethernet transmissions, network transmissions, and for Wi-Fi or wireless, it's 802.11. And there was also an 802.1x we talked about in the wireless security module, which added additional security, port security, by limiting the port access of the Wi-Fi device, the WAP device in, back into the uh, router. So all networks today virtually have some sort of remote access, right? And there's advantages and disadvantages. We talked about how uh, a VPN would also uh, secure things and secure the access, remote access to a network. So let's look at these real quick. So advantages are you, you, you have to authenticate through a VPN. So you're verified both ends of the party are verified. That's the top left hand white box under advantage. The second white box under advantage is productivity. Obviously people can work from home and they don't have to drive in. If there's a problem, they can do things remotely. They can be potentially away visiting uh, friends or relatives will be on, on vacation, heaven forbid, but it happens, right? You can, for an emergency, you could, you know, log in. And it obviously cuts down on the last white box here under advantage, uh, overhead expenses. The big saving is office space. And more and more as a result of our uh, pandemic COVID, we've had more and more people working from home and many working from home on a permanent basis. So obviously there will be a lot of uh, cost savings in terms of square footage office space that will no longer be used and there will be uh, sort of a, a repurposing, I'm sure, <clears throat> of that space at some point. Disadvantages, folks are connecting from home or from remote locations, friends' homes on a variety of different devices. It's convenient for them. Uh, you have the productivity advantages, but it makes it a little bit more challenging in terms of securing these devices and ensuring that there is some problem or just supporting it, that they work, that the, the, the version of their browsers or their operating system there is working properly with the applications at work. That's sort of a, a challenge is managing and supporting this heterogeneity of devices. And the other problem that we began to touch upon is malware, that there could be viruses or malware on these remote devices if they're not corporate owned and maintained and they have the right uh, updated browser versions and software operating system versions that are pushed to them. That might not be the case 
for personal uh, devices that are connecting to the to the network. And then finally, there's complexity in terms of traffic, right? You've got to support a VPN. You've got to support some some connectivity that's remote from different locations through different uh, you know uh, bandwidth uh, capacities. Someone's remote, they, they'll be going through the internet. They may not be as guaranteed uh, in terms of the uh, quality of the connection. But uh, but you know, with everything you do, there are pros and cons, and and these are the advantages of remote connection. Uh, for, for devices, including, you know, some security issues with, uh, you know, the potential of introducing malware to your network because of these remote devices. So what about managing remote access? So that needs to be managed as well. So there, there are four categories here. Authorized user list. There should be a list of who has access and who doesn't, well, not who doesn't, but who has access, remote access. And that should be reviewed quarterly. There may be people who have remote access who never use it, don't need it. Pull them off the list. If you, you know, the fewer access points that you have, the better. You know, the whole concept of uh, minimum privileges give them, give everyone the minimum amount of privilege to the system, whether it's application access or remote access. Uh, minimal is better. You just have fewer opportunities for um, a bad actor or a hacker to get into your system. Um, access approval process management should be reviewing this process annually. You should be looking at who approves. Who gets access to the system what level of the system which applications and again least privilege ensuring that uh, individuals who are getting access are not getting any greater access when they're remoting when they're uh, remote in or they have remote access uh, so that should be re reviewed annually as well and training of course people need to be trained on what the policies are how to how to uh, connect what are the proper ways if there's a vpn they need to always use the vpn if there's some um, there are some uh, techniques that you could examine all of the machines, whether they're owned by the company or not, um, and push updates to browsers, updates to operating systems. You know, again, it depends on a lot of variables. Cost is one of them. You know, you have to balance the whole concept of cost versus risk and make an assessment in terms of, uh, you know, what what uh, you know what constitutes uh, the best access or the, the proper access to the system and how people are trained properly to uh, to access your, your system. Or if you're um, introducing multi-factor authentication, that's also a training issue for new new employees. And there's always turnover in companies and you have to maintain that, uh, you know, that consistency. And the final box here is set, set defined timeout, day of time, location rules. You could mitigate risks by limiting time, time of day, day of the week, or by uh, GPS locations. Uh, not all users need access 24 by seven. Not everyone needs to access the system 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, IT people may need that, certain executives may need that as well. But um, you know, if you should limit as much as you can uh, access to the system by person, by their role. So again, you don't have this sort of wide open, easy access to the system 24 by seven. So those are just some things to think about in terms of managing remote access. So ideally, I like this slide because it provides a little bit of a summary too in terms of the techniques that people use to uh, uh, to secure their systems. But needless to say, in the ideal world, folks who access the system remotely should have the same level of security that those devices should have the same protection, shouldn't be any different in terms of safeguards, regardless of whether you're accessing the system internally and in, within the corporate you know uh, facility or remotely and you know from miles and miles away and here's a little list of things that sort of remind us of uh, areas we've touched upon obviously you have to have the proper authentication authorization accounting limiting access the whole concept of use the least privilege model give uh, individuals the least amount of access to the system as possible terminating users who have left the organization really this is disabling, uh, you know, terminating maybe is a little too strong a word. You don't delete someone from access. You you want to have that history, but you will you disable users who know who have left the organization. Uh, audit and controls on access and organizational changes. Obviously, there's this whole concept of continually. We learned about this earlier in the class, in the earlier module. Obviously, you have to make sure that as people change their roles in the organization, whether they, they're promoted or move laterally, laterally into other organizations, 
that they still maintain least privileged model, that you're ensuring that they don't have access they should no longer have because their job changed, their role changed, their department changed. We have to ensure that we, they have the least privilege and that needs to be audited. And then secure data transfers. So FTP is file transfer protocol. File transfer protocol should always be a secured file transfer protocol. There should be an S in front of the FTP or an S after it. They're different protocols, not to worry about that, but uh, there always should be a secured version of the FTP process so that the data is encrypted for privacy and for data integri integrity purposes. And then finally, the last bullet here is a bullet on multi-factor authentication, a password in addition to the password, a token, a smart card, some kind of number that uh, is on a, soft, a software application on your phone that's on your smartphone that's uh, coordinated with your server. So you log on, you do your uh, putting your password and your phone gives you a, uh, a, a token that you can uh, uh, accept or type into a system depending on how it's configured. So those are just, it's a nice review. This is just another screen that reminds everyone remote access uh, should have the same level of security as uh, on-premises access and has a half a dozen bullet points to just uh, to consider. Many industries, if not all industries, utilize a multitude of file transfers and these file transfers are over the internet, usually within a VPN as well, but sometimes not. Sometimes just there are encrypted files that are not through VPNs, but um, it, it should, you'd be shocked, you'd be really surprised how many companies or how many files even a medium-sized company has to transfer back and forth, whether they're through through government agencies or through partners or customers, you know, or suppliers in the supply chain. Um, it, it's a lot. It's it's much more than you would think. So you don't need to really know the details on this slide, but I just I'm just offering it to sort of explain the two different kinds of um, uh, protocols. FTPS uses SSL TLS for those who are interested, and SFTP. The last large bullet here uh, that uses the secured shell SSH. So um, uh, this is a, uh, a just a detail screen you don't need to really know, but I just added it here for your own edification for those who may be interested in these details. And this ends our presentation on network security.